Uh, my name is Dylan, and I'm an engineer at Stripe. Uh, and Stripe is a software platform for building and running an online business. And today, I'm going to tell you about our project for migrating 600 private repositories from GitHub.com to GitHub Enterprise. Uh, and we did this in a way that was pretty seamless for our internal customers, as well as fairly painless for us on the migration team as well. And we did this by leveraging techniques that Stripe has used for a long time for making big, under-the-hood changes uh, without too much uh, end-user disruption. So I'll talk a little bit about how Stripe uses GitHub and share some of the requirements that we had for our move from GitHub.com to GitHub Enterprise. I'll talk about how we developed a plan that we could trust to meet those requirements, the preparation work we had to put in to be able to execute on that plan in production, and how our production migration actually went. So Stripe uses GitHub in a lot of ways, just like you. Uh, we use GitHub as part of a broader development productivity tool chain that allows us to deliver software that processes over 100 million API requests per day and billions of dollars per year. Now, because Stripe is a global company operating global economic infrastructure, there's no good time for us to just take this down when we need to make changes to it. Uh, imagine, for example, that you couldn't get a lift home from the conference today uh, because Stripe was down. I know I wouldn't be very happy about that. And because we're a global company working on this infrastructure all the time, uh, we have similar availability expectations for our developer tools as well. We quite literally have to get pushed to get paid. Stripe has over 600 private Git repositories. Over 550 people at Stripe actively use GitHub in one way or another. And at our peak, we've pushed up to 200 requests per second to GitHub. Now, this includes HTTP and SSH transactions, and a lot of it comes from our build system, uh, as well as a pretty tight integration that we built on top of pull requests to implement our own code review flow. So Stripe has used GitHub.com for a long time, but there came a point where it made sense for us to move to GitHub Enterprise. Uh, this is an actual picture of my boss telling me that we were going to do this project. Um, there were many reasons for us to move to GitHub Enterprise, uh, but the main one is that we wanted to uh, run an instance of it within our Amazon Web Services network uh, so that we could host our source code within our private network. And as you might expect, we kicked off this project by defining our requirements, the things that would have to be true for us to consider this project a success. So we wanted to move all of our users and all of our private repositories over to GitHub Enterprise. And we didn't want to impact incident response in any way. So you can imagine that maybe we were exporting all these repositories and then importing them, and then maybe reconfiguring our systems to talk to GitHub Enterprise, where they used to talk to GitHub.com. And at any point in this process, some unrelated production incident could occur. And we weren't able to say, sorry, you can't deal with this production incident uh, because we're working on GitHub. That just wasn't an option for us. And we didn't want to disrupt developer productivity either, uh, either during or after the migration. And I'm going to dig into this one a little bit more because there's a lot to it. So what does it mean to protect productivity during a migration like this? Well, the first consideration we had to make was around repository unavailability. And this is because we decided that we would restrict access to our repositories on GitHub.com before copying them over to GitHub Enterprise in order to ensure data consistency. We basically wanted to ensure that no one would be making changes to the GitHub.com copy once we had already started moving it over to GitHub Enterprise. So we were willing to accept some amount of repository unavailability for this, but we did put some constraints on that. Any repository downtime would just have to be as short as possible. Uh, it's expensive and not ideal when your engineers are blocked because they can't access your repository. The downtime would have to be accurately estimated as well. Uh, and this is because uh, exporting and importing these repositories could take anywhere from minutes to hours. And so we needed to know what we were signing up for, and we also needed to be able to clearly communicate to everyone else in the company uh, what they should expect when their favorite repositories were going to be down and then back up again. And repository downtime would also have to be easily canceled, like I mentioned, uh, in order to make sure that we had a clear path uh, to respond to any production incident that could occur during the migration. Another part of protecting productivity is just keeping everything working after the migration once we were fully on GitHub Enterprise. So we needed confidence that all of our core development workflows would continue to work just like they did before. So I'm writing some code. I push a branch to GitHub. Uh, our continuous integration system runs a build. I look at my test results. Maybe I iterate some more. I open a pull request, do code review, merge that, deploy it with our deploy system. All that would have to keep working just like it did before. And we also needed to be confident that we could operate GitHub Enterprise with an acceptable level of availability. 
And this just came from the fact that this is a brand new piece of software that we had no experience running, uh, and we wanted to, to rapidly gain that experience uh, before relying on it fully. So once we defined our requirements, it was time to figure out a migration plan that would allow us to meet those requirements. So you may be familiar with this quote that says that any complex working system evolved from a simple working system. And this has served me pretty well throughout my engineering career. And this is where we started for our GitHub Enterprise project as well. We thought, what is the simplest possible plan, the most straightforward plan we can think of that'll get all of our repositories moved over? And this is what we came up with. First, we'd start by restricting access to all those private repositories to ensure data consistency. Then we'd use the GitHub migration API to export all of those out of github.com. Then we'd import them all into GitHub Enterprise using the command line tools on our instance. Then we'd reconfigure all of our systems that used to talk to github.com, things like our uh, continuous integration system and our build system and our deploy system, reconfigure all of those to instead talk to GitHub Enterprise. And then grant access to the migrated repositories uh, once they were all moved over and once our systems were reconfigured. But this, even though this plan was simple, it fell apart pretty quickly when we checked it against our requirements. So let's do that. So yes, we would have migrated all of our users and all of our private repositories by following this plan. But we were at risk of impacting incident response. And the reason for this is we were doing the whole thing in one big shot. So we were going to export all 600 of these and then import all 600 of them and then reconfigure all of our systems all in one big, uh, one big shot. And we just weren't confident that at any single point in that process, if someone said, hey, I urgently need to use GitHub to push a fix, we weren't confident that at any point in that process, we would be able to let them do that. We were also at risk of impacting developer productivity. And this is because by doing everything in one big shot like this, it was going to be really tough to, for us to estimate exactly how long all of this was going to take. And even if we could estimate it, that estimate would probably lead us to believe that it was going to take just a really long time. Uh, and we'd also be going from zero users and zero traffic and zero data on GitHub Enterprise all the way to 100% of our users and 100% of our data and 100% of our traffic going to, going to GitHub Enterprise. And going from zero to 100 very quickly like that uh, didn't seem like a good recipe for uh, sort of ensuring that all of those workflows uh, and the stability of the Enterprise instance uh, were going to be there. So this plan was a no-go. Uh, maybe it would have worked fine, but we just weren't super happy about our chances. So then we thought, now what? Uh, we, no one could really tell us how to do this migration the way we wanted to, uh, so we started thinking about other big changes that Stripe has made uh, in the past without uh, uh, materially affecting user experience. And what we realized is that basically the entire delta between Stripe when it launched in 2011 to the Stripe of today, that entire delta happened while Stripe was up and running and processing real charges and moving real money for real users. And some pretty big changes have happened during this time. Things like adding new payment methods or enabling new business models or rewriting our PCI infrastructure from Ruby to Go or even moving all of our servers from a data center in Northern California to a data center in Oregon. We figured if a team at Stripe could move all of our servers to a new data center and have Stripe stay up, we could probably change this one little internal piece of Stripe and have that go okay too. And what all of these changes had in common is that they weren't actually big changes. They were a bunch of small changes. So instead of having one big risky change, those teams broke that change down into a bunch of smaller ones that they could apply at their own pace so that they would apply each change and then only proceed to the next one uh, once they had verified that that smaller incremental change uh, had worked. Uh, and if it didn't work, they would just roll it back. And this incremental migration pattern seemed like something we really wanted to be able to try for our GitHub Enterprise migration. So in order to develop an incremental migration plan, we had to answer a few questions first. The first question is, what are our increments? So moving incrementally means moving piece by piece. What are those pieces going to be? Were we going to move some teams over at a time, some repositories over at a time? We weren't sure. We had to figure that out. We also had to know if we could undo any of these increments if necessary uh, so that we could roll back and always be in a known good state. And then how is everything going to work during this transitional phase where we had some repositories and some users on GitHub.com and some repositories and some users moved over to GitHub Enterprise? And we knew we didn't want to be in this two GitHub world for too long because having everyone have to use two GitHubs just has more cognitive overhead than using one. 
Uh, but we wanted to be in that phase for long enough so that we could sort of gradually build confidence uh, in our ability to run GitHub Enterprise and, and have that work for everyone. So to answer the first question, what our unit of migration was going to be, it made a lot of sense for us to choose repositories. So this is the GitHub API endpoint uh, for starting a migration. Uh, and you basically just give it a list of repositories that you own, and then GitHub will kick off an asynchronous job uh, to export those for you. But we didn't want to export all 600 of our repositories at once, because that wouldn't be very incremental. We also didn't want to migrate them just one at a time, because that would be really toilsome. So we figured we should probably break up this list of 600 repositories into a smaller manageable number of phases. And we had to figure out how to break them up, so we took a look at our data to do that. Uh, so this is a graph of our repositories on the x-axis, and then the y-axis is, the y -axis is how many recent commits that repository has seen, which is a pretty good proxy for just how active that repository is at Stripe. And you can see towards the bottom there, there are a whole bunch of repositories that have had no recent activity. Uh, basically, no one was touching them. And so we figured those were probably going to be the least risky to move. So we could start with those. Uh, and if we messed that up, uh, that probably wouldn't be uh, as much of a big deal as if we messed up some of these ones towards the top that had a lot of activity happening on them. And this becomes a lot more apparent when you reorder these uh, by the number of commit activity. So these are the phases that we ended up with. We were going to start with a single Canary repository. This is a repository that my team was working in every single day, uh, but not many other people at Stripe were using. And this would get us dogfooding GitHub Enterprise very early on in production and allow us to uh, quickly suss out any very glaring problems uh, that we'd have to fix uh, before we would uh, expose the rest of the company to them. Then we could move uh, this big batch of repositories that had no activity, really. And then there were, there were these sort of medium activity, medium risk repositories. Then there were about 50 that were pretty business critical to us and also just had a lot of people working on them. So we'd move those toward the end uh, because we wanted to have more confidence that we could uh, move those uh, correctly on the first try. And then there's our mono repo, uh, the single largest, most important, most critical, uh, most everything repository to Stripe. Uh, this one was really important and we really needed to get that migration right. Uh, so we saved that one toward the end. The next question was, how do we undo any of these batches of repositories if necessary? So say we move uh, a bunch of repositories over and find some problem with them, they're not working correctly, uh, people can't use them for some reason on GitHub Enterprise, how are we going to roll that back? Well, I mentioned at the start that we chose to restrict access to our repositories uh, on the github.com side in order to uh, ensure data consistency before migrating them, migrating them over. And we were able to do this using a Boolean parameter in the GitHub Migration API called locked repositories. And this is what a locked repository looks like. Uh, as you can tell, you can't change the repository or modify it in any way uh, from the web interface, and you also can't modify it through Git uh, or through the API. So this is a really effective way uh, to make sure that no one is going to make changes to this repository. And then, as you might expect, there's a corresponding API endpoint for unlocking a repository. So normally, the way you would use this is that you'd lock the repositories on the github.com side, export them, import them, and then unlock them on the GitHub Enterprise side. But this unlock API endpoint actually turned out to be our key to a quick rollback as well. Because uh, wh what we would do is, if we were migrating a batch of locked repositories, if anyone urgently came to us and said, hey, I really need to push a fix, I really need to access this repository, all we would have to do is issue this unlock API call uh, on the github.com side, and then it would be immediately returned to service uh, for them to use. And maybe we had some in-progress copies going on or something, and we could just throw that away and try that entire phase of the migration again later. So this is going to work really well for us as a rollback mechanism, because we could issue this API command in a matter of seconds, really. Then there was the question of how do we deal with this two GitHub world? Uh, and this is what it looked like uh, on our, our backend side, at least. Uh, so we have services like our continuous integration service, our deploy service, and a whole bunch of other uh, developer productivity-related tools, uh, all talking to GitHub.com and GitHub Enterprise. So they'd be receiving webhooks from both, and they'd also need to dispatch API requests to both. And for any given repository, uh, that repository only lived in one of those places, there was, so there was only one correct place to dispatch that API request. The way we chose to handle this is by uh, keeping state uh, of uh, the exact migration status of all of our repositories in a single configuration file that we called migrated.yaml. And we kept this in a Git repository itself so that we could track changes to it, uh, just like you would collaborate on any file in any Git repository. 
So in this example, I am uh, committing a change to change the llama repository from false to true, indicating that we had moved it over to GitHub Enterprise, and that's where its new home is. And this is great because we could collaborate on it as a team and all sort of know exactly what was going on with our repositories. But we were also able to use the GitHub API to have all of our services read from that file as well uh, so that they would know where to dispatch API requests. And that worked out pretty well. So we had an incremental migration plan that seemed like it was going to work. We answered those questions we had to answer. Uh, so let's check this plan against our requirements. So yeah, we'd migrate all of our users and all of our private repositories over. It would take a little bit longer because we were doing it in phases, but we would get there. We'd also be able to quickly roll back at any point during the migration by unlocking the repositories on the github.com side, uh, which kept our path clear for incident response. And because we were moving the repositories over uh, sort of batch by batch, starting with these uh, lower risk ones and working our way up to the ones that were higher risk and would send more traffic to GitHub Enterprise and have more users working on GitHub Enterprise, we would achieve this sort of controlled turn up uh, that would allow us to gain the confidence that we wanted, uh, that all of our development workflows would work, uh, and that GitHub Enterprise would just run for us. So great, this seemed like a plan that was gonna work. So once we had a plan that we thought was gonna work, uh, it was time to just put in a bunch of work to get ready to execute on that in our production environment. So first we had to set up an instance of GitHub Enterprise in production. Then we had to modify those services to read from that migrated.yaml file. And then we'd test our migration plan. So our GitHub Enterprise setup looked a little bit like this. Uh, we had a production primary instance and a production replica instance. We also had another pair of these in our staging environment, which would allow us to do things like uh, test new releases of GitHub Enterprise before rolling them out to our production environment. GitHub also provides backup tools for backing up your GitHub Enterprise instance, and they're pretty good, so I really recommend that you use them. And so we wanted to set up servers to run those and then upload the backups uh, to where the rest of our backups are stored. And then there were just all these touch points where we had to integrate GitHub Enterprise uh, with all of our existing infrastructure. Uh, so we had to wire it up to things like our user authentication system, our logging system, our metrics and monitoring system, uh, and our system for sending email. So once we wired all that up, it was time to test. So what do we test? First, we tested all of those core development workflows that we knew would need to work. Uh, so I'm writing some code, I push a branch, my tests run, I iterate some more, open a pull request, do code review, merge it, deploy it. We tested all of that multiple times over. We tested all of the operational procedures that we knew we'd have to be familiar with in order to sustainably run GitHub Enterprise in the long term. So these are things like failing over from the primary to the replica in case anything happened to the primary, uh, upgrading to a new release of GitHub Enterprise, uh, or restoring from backup if we needed to. And we also tested our entire migration plan, that entire phase plan of moving all 600 of those repositories over in phases. We tested that entire thing multiple times. And GitHub recommended that we do this, and we were really, really happy that we did this. So take it from both of us. You're gonna really, really wanna do this. Uh, and there are a few reasons for this. First, you're gonna learn how to transform your data. And what I mean by that is, the process that GitHub's tools go through uh, as they're importing your repository into GitHub Enterprise is that they're basically mapping database records from github.com into your database uh, on your GitHub Enterprise instance. And depending on the order in which you migrate things, some inconsistencies might occur there. And this is expected. GitHub documents how to handle this, and they provide tools for handling this. Uh, so you're going to learn how to use those. You'll also get practice restoring from backup. So very commonly what we would do is we would test phase one of the migration and maybe that went fine. And then we test phase two and maybe that phase went fine. And then we test phase three and maybe we hit some bug or some snag and have to refine our plan. And the easiest way to just retest phase three again would be to restore to a backup uh, from right before we had tested it, uh, which meant that we got really good at restoring from backup, which is a good skill to have, right? And then this is maybe the most important one. By doing exports and imports for all of these phases of the migration, you're gonna learn how long each of these phases takes. Because again, they could be from minutes to hours, and you're gonna wanna know what you're signing up for, and you're gonna wanna be able to tell everyone else who's depending on GitHub at your company uh, what they're signing up for too, or what you have signed them up for. So we tested a whole bunch of stuff, and we found a whole bunch of things. First, there were just some bugs in how we integrated GitHub Enterprise with our system, so we worked out the kinks there. Then we had to figure out how to best transform our data uh, using GitHub's tools. Uh, we figured out how to use those. Then we found that there was some data that just didn't migrate over. 
So normally this wouldn't be a problem because Git is designed to be decentralized. So it's really hard to push a Git repository from one server to another and experience any data loss. But GitHub adds all of this interesting data around a Git repository, things like uh, user accounts and settings and pull requests, and all of this is migrated using GitHub's proprietary tools. And those tools migrate most of this stuff, but not all of it. Uh, and some of that stuff was pretty important to us, things like pull request assignees and commit statuses. So we ended up writing our own scripts using the API to migrate that stuff for us. And then as we were text testing exporting these repositories out of github.com, sometimes those exports would just fail. And they would fail for a few reasons. The asynchronous jobs that GitHub runs to export the repositories for you have time limits. So if you give it a big enough list of repositories, you could just trip that time limit. So you might have to sort of rework uh, how you split your repositories up into phases in order to fit all of your phases underneath that time limit. And similarly, uh, the exported archives that this API gives you also have size limits. So you may need to uh, change how your repositories are split up to fit under that limit as well. And then there was what we affectionately came to call the emoji bug, uh, which GitHub has since fixed, so thank you. Uh, but I want to tell you about it anyway because I just like it so much. So the deal with the emoji bug is that we were trying to export one of our repositories, and it kept failing, and we weren't sure why. Uh, it was not very big. It wasn't taking very long. It should be totally unremarkable, uh, but it kept failing. So we reached out to GitHub support uh, and had them take a look, and this is what they told us. They said they found some unusual characters in the branch names referred to by some of our pull requests. And they said, aside from their unusual nature, the characters seem valid and don't indicate a sign of corruption. And what they meant by this is, one of my coworkers put a horse emoji in a branch name. Uh, and in fact, several of my coworkers put several horse emoji or other emoji in, in branch names. Uh, and this just happened to trigger some bug in the export process, causing it to crash. Uh, so it's since been fixed. Uh, but a good rule of thumb if you're trying to sell software to Stripe or trying to get us to use your software is that if a text field exists, my coworkers are going to try to put emoji into it. Uh, so you better let them. So once we worked out all the kinks and had a migration plan that we had tested and verified, uh, it was time to do the actual production migration. So how did it go? Well, several things went wrong. But we also kind of knew that this was going to happen, which is why we spent so much time on an incremental reversible plan in the first place. So instead of saying that several things went wrong, instead I'm going to say we got better at migrating after quickly rolling back several times. And this doesn't sound quite as good. Uh, it sounds not as good as like, everything just going perfectly the first time. Uh, but it was actually a great outcome for us. Uh, so I'm going to go with it. And this is a graph that illustrates what I mean. Uh, so this is the graph of active sessions on our GitHub Enterprise instance. And that big spike at the end there is when we had finished migrating that big mono repo. And you can see that for the few weeks leading up to that, we did have some traffic already going to GitHub Enterprise. And that's because we had finished migrating uh, all the repositories up until that big mono repo. And in those few weeks, we were actually trying and failing several times to, to move the mono repo over. Uh, but while we were doing that, all of our engineers were able to use both GitHub Enterprise and GitHub.com, depending on the repository they were working on, to get their work done. This is actually my favorite graph uh, from our migration. Uh, I mentioned that we have a pretty tight integration with GitHub pull requests, uh, where we sort of implement a whole bunch of checks and, and our own sort of code review workflow on top of them. Uh, and when we were on GitHub.com, when you use the GitHub.com API, uh, you're only allowed to make a certain number of API requests per hour. And so this graph, no one on my team liked this graph at all, uh, because what it meant was uh, when that quota went down to zero, one of us would get paged, and there was nothing we could actually really do about it. Uh, except to watch code review break for the entire company, which uh, wasn't fun. Um, and then we just have to cross our fingers and hope that the quota would reset. Uh, so as you can see at the end there, as it levels off, uh, this became a thing of a past uh, when we moved all of our stuff over to GitHub Enterprise. Uh, now, of course, we're completely capable of sending way too, too, way too much traffic uh, to our GitHub Enterprise instance uh, and tripping its rate limits or overwhelming it in some way. Uh, but at least we have some more uh, flexibility and headroom uh, to figure that out for ourselves. So we did end up migrating everything to GitHub Enterprise successfully, and we did end up satisfying all of our goals. But I saved one part of the story for the end, because it's such a good example of what it means to put your users first during a migration like this, which happens to be one of Stripe's operating principles. So to tell you the story, I want to first tell you about ShipDat, which is my favorite mailing list at Stripe. Uh, and maybe my favorite mailing list ever, but I don't actually have a list of my favorite mailing lists. 
Uh, but if I did, it would be at the top, I think. Um, and the deal with ship that is that uh, whenever you're about to ship something big, uh, or you have shipped something big, uh, or maybe you fix something big within the company, uh, you write an email and send it to this list describing what it is that you did, uh, how you did it, why you did it, why it was hard, what challenges you overcame, and perhaps most importantly, uh, how our users' lives will be better for what you did. And what I really like about ship that uh, is, I mean, of course, like, everyone sends to this list, uh, and everyone gets to see it and celebrate each other's work, so that's great. Uh, but the other thing that I really like is that we will often write the ship that emails not at the end of the project, but at the beginning. And the reason for this is it forces us to figure out exactly what we're going to deliver to our users, which is a really good exercise to undertake before you start writing any code. So what would an aspirational ship that email look like for our GetUp Enterprise project? It might look like this. We wanted to say, when you come into work on Monday, you're not going to have to do anything to pick up on GitHub Enterprise where you left off on GitHub.com. Your account repositories and pull requests will be there waiting for you, and Git and GitHub will continue to work just as they did before. And this sounded great. This sounded like exactly what we wanted to ship, and we had designed our plan with this in mind, and so we, we thought we were on track to achieve this. But at a certain point in our testing process, as we were thinking about this more, we realized we were actually going to miss the mark. And the reason for this is probably what people were going to do when they walked into work on Monday is do a git pull in their favorite repository. And instead of that just working and being really seamless, instead they would see this, repository not found. And this is because their local clone of the repository had no knowledge of the fact that we had moved the repository from github.com to github enterprise. So their local clones would still be trying to pull from github.com and fail. But there is a command that you can run to change uh, the, the local uh, remote for a Git repository. So we thought, OK, we can totally fix this. We can just run that command to change the origin on all the affected repository clones, on all the laptops of all the Git users at Stripe, once for every phase of the migration, and more every time we had to roll back and roll forward. Uh, so this is another one of those things where like, maybe it would have worked. Uh, but even if it did, this is what I would have looked like at the end uh, had we gone this route. Uh, it really didn't feel like something that was going to scale well for 550 50 active GitHub users. So what would the aspirational ship that email for this part look like? For this part, what we'd love to say is, your locally cloned repositories are going to continue to work without intervention because we've pre-configured your Git client to dynamically route Git operations to the correct origin. Now, we had no idea how to actually do this, but we wrote it down because it sounded great. It sounded like exactly what we wanted. Uh, but we got to thinking about it some more, and we poked around in the Git documentation and wrote some prototypes and did some experiments. And we actually did figure out how to do this. And it actually worked, and it was actually kind of awesome. Uh, so I'm going to share that secret sauce with you today. So what we did is we worked with our IT engineering team to first distribute a software package to everybody's laptop before the migration even started. And that software package installed a couple of things. First, it installed some Git configuration that would override the origin URLs for all of our private repositories to instead invoke a remote helper script. Now, with Git, a remote helper script is a way to teach it a new protocol. So Git understands SSH and HTTP and other protocols. And if you wanted to teach it a new one, you could write a remote helper script for that. We didn't actually want to do that. We just wanted to call out to SSH but first insert a little bit of custom code uh, so that we could basically change uh, where that SSH was calling out to. And what that custom code would do is perform queries against our service discovery system, which we could keep up to date with the location for every repository. So throughout the migration, as we were moving repositories over or rolling back, uh, we would just update the service discovery system. Uh, we use console, but you could use whatever you use. Uh, we would update that with the contents of that migrated.yaml file, and then this remote helper script would know where to send uh, SSH. So let's go through that git pull again with this configuration installed. So the origin would start out configured to be talking to github.com, which may be wrong for this repository at this time. And then the git configuration would override the origin uh, to invoke our remote helper script. And then git would invoke the remote helper script whenever we, someone did a git push or a git pull. Our script would talk to our service discovery system to figure out the real location of the repository. And then our script would exec SSH uh, with the real origin substituted in. 
And so now all the Git operations were, in fact, uh, routed to the right place. So awesome. This did actually work. Uh, I'm sort of a little bit still surprised that it did, but it was cool. Uh, we got some good feedback about it. Someone said, nice, that console lookup is really clever. I was curious how that works so seamlessly. And this is my favorite piece of feedback from the whole project. I can barely believe this happened. This is really what we were going for in terms of seamlessness. So we learned a whole lot from this project. Uh, it was pretty uniquely shaped and, and not like anything we had ever seen before. Uh, but what I actually was more happy about was that we also revalidated all of these engineering practices that Stripe has already been using for a long time to make big, risky changes uh, without disrupting users. And I gained more confidence that we'll be able to reapply these techniques again in the future uh, on new different problems that we haven't seen before. And these are techniques like putting your users first. So instead of from starting from where you are, maybe you have some code written, uh, and then make some changes and, and hope that you're sort of getting towards a better user experience, and maybe you can make local decisions and, and do that. Uh, instead, take a step back and think about what is the absolute best possible thing you could ship to your users? Regardless of what you already have, what is the absolute best possible thing you could ship to them? And work backwards from there. Now, this process of back solving to where you are right now can be really difficult. And it can also cause you to have to do a lot more work. But it's an incredibly effective exercise to make sure that you're doing what your users really want. And similarly, treat your infrastructure like a product. So just because you're not on like the product team shipping product doesn't mean you're not working on a product. Your users just happen to be sitting at desk next to you. So talk to them. Figure out how they're using your infrastructure. Figure out what they need from it. And figure out how to make changes to it in a way that'll make them happy. And make those big changes incrementally. So take your big risky change, break it down into a bunch of smaller ones, apply those at your own pace so that you can verify at each step of the way uh, that the change is good, or roll it back if you have to. And put your users first, but think about yourself too. So it's no accident that the migration plan that we came up with did not involve a bunch of engineers locked in a conference room for 72 hours. Uh, that wouldn't have been really fun. Uh, but also, the truth is just that an uh, engineering team that's well-rested and hasn't been up for 72 hours is just going to do much better work and make many fewer mistakes uh, than a team that is totally sleep-deprived. So don't let anyone try to convince you uh, that sleep de deprivation is necessary for finishing a big project like this. And finally, ask for help. I can't tell you the number of times when uh, the two or three of us that were working on this project full time would sit down at lunch uh, and talk to our coworkers and tell them about the latest problem we were facing with our enterprise migration, uh, tell them about the latest challenge we were chewing on, and then we'd come away from that lunch uh, with tons of new ideas from these people with expertise in different areas and tons of just offers to help, too. So this is how we got contributions from within Stripe uh, from teams like security and IT and storage and observability. And that was all just because we talked to them and said, hey, like, this is what we're dealing with. Do you know something we could try? And similarly, we asked for, GitHub, we asked for help from GitHub, too, uh, because we really needed to know uh, the limits of the migration tools, as well as a lot about how GitHub Enterprise worked in order to uplevel the user experience that we were able to achieve during a migration like this. So I really want to thank everyone at Stripe who helped us with this project, as well as everyone at GitHub who helped us with this project. Uh, and I want to thank you, too, for coming. Uh, so if you have any questions for me, feel free to get in touch uh, or find me later today. Uh, otherwise, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.